the motivation of this paper is to look at universal basic income programs. This is to define it, an unconditional craft transfer in which people can choose without any restrictions how to use the funds. It's universal, or at least quasi-universal. You may restrict it to non-citizens, and it's substantial. This is an increasingly popular policy proposal, and it's become even more so lately for obvious reasons. And UBI has been seen as a way to help deal uh, with various problems that society faces, uh, depending on who you're talking to. One of them might be that the current social safety net is inadequate and very complicated. Uh, there's growing inequality and there's very low intergenerational mobility. And then, you know, a fear that's often talked about is that, you know, we're going, we as human beings are going to become obsolete, we're going to lose jobs, uh, and how are we going to live? Okay. So what are the consequences of universal basic income? We really have very, very little evidence to base ourselves on. Most of it is uh, very partial, short-run evidence from a variety of cash transfer pro programs. And what we're especially ignorant about are the uh, longer run, larger scale consequences of UBI. That's what our paper, a hole that our paper kind of uh, wants to fill. We think we have a very inexpensive computational laboratory that we can bring to bear to this program uh, question. And uh, that's what I'll try to get through today. So very quickly, I'm gonna go through the skeleton of the model very little talk about the estimation, uh, touch briefly on validation. I'll spend most of the time talking about the effects of a universal basic income program uh, in this economy. And then if I have time, which I very much doubt I will, I'll talk about alternative forms of taxation and how one might use this uh, uh, model to use to think about automation and mobilization. Okay. so. Three so outlines of the model, uh, we have um, overlapping generations, uh, a very style model with four stages. People live through college, uh, childhood, college, work, and retirement. There's uncertainty and incomplete markets, endogenous savings, labor supply, college choices. There's going to be wages. And in the background, there's always going to be an aggregate firm that's going to be taking capital. And the two types of uh, labor that there's going to be non college and college labor and uh, combining them. Natella, uh, um, some people say that we, we hear you with uh, some uh, um, like echo? kind of echo, yes. Can you hear me better now? I put yes, myself closer better. to this? Sorry. Yes, better. Yeah, I have to get a better mic system uh, next time. I'm not teaching this semester, so I haven't seen the problem yet. Okay, Thanks. the main uh, thing in our model is that we're also going to have endogenous intergenerational links. In particular, our parents are going to care about their kids. They're going to uh, help form their kids' skills by investing time and money uh, in them when they're young. And they're also going to do monetary transfers to kids when they get older. Why would there be a uh, role for uh, government intervention? Because of the imperfect capital and insurance markets, and also because this is an OLG model, we don't have the ability of children to write contracts with their parents to make uh, 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 say, greater skill investments or greater transfers to them that would be paid back later. So let me take you quickly through the model. Um, so uh, as I said, an agent's going to live through 20 periods. Each period should be thought of as corresponding to four years in real life. Uh, when they're born, they live with their parents. Uh, they don't make any decisions during that time period. That happens till the age of 16, or till J equals five in period years. During that period, the, the parent's gonna be investing in their kid's skill. And also, when the kid eight reaches age 16, that's when they become what we call independent. And at that point, right, when they become independent, the parent can transfer some assets to their kid. When um, that, that age of 16, which is my daughter's age, is a very important uh, uh, age because that's when they get to choose whether or not they want to go to college or they want to go straight to work. Uh, if they go to college, you're going to spend four years there, or at least one period. If they work, they enter the labor market. Uh, college is going to be costly, but it's going to have its benefits of giving you higher human capital and changing your wage profile. Um, so then... Um, the 
as of age, as of uh, period J5, if they don't go to college, or J equals six, if they do go to college, they're going to be entering the labor market. When they enter the labor market, they're going to be making uh, labor supply decisions. They're going to be earning, uh, earning wages that depends on age, education, skill, and a productivity shock. And they're also going to, at a particular point in time, exogenously, in particular at real age eight, uh, 28, J equals eight, they're going to have uh, a child. And at that point, they're going to be making investment in their child's skills using time and money. At the age of J equals 18, 68, 68 they're going to retire. Uh, when they retire, they're going to live, up, live uh, on their savings and also on social security income. And then at J equals 21, at the beginning of that, they're going to die. Uh, and this is, um, yeah. Okay. How does universal basic income change this, uh, the, the profile of what is, uh, an agent goes through? Well, every uh, universal basic income is going to be given, at least in our model economy, from the moment you become an independent agent. That is, at the beginning of J equals 5. So it can help you uh, finance your college decision. You're facing imperfect capital markets. You're actually going to have uh, access to subsidized loans, but still, you know, you might, it might be very useful for that. It, it's going to, while you're working, it's going to help you smooth consumption. It's also going to relax constraints of investing money in your child's skills. Um, and lastly, when you retire, it's going to be providing a cushion a cushion in terms of extra funds that you can use to uh, fund your consumption during that time period. I'm going to take you relatively quickly through a few value uh, function problems um, just to fix some ideas. So let me just take you through a typical work, work period problem. When an agent is working, so this is as of, as of period five or six, um, they're going to have a certain amount of access, A, a certain level of skill, data, a given level of education, either high school or college, and they're going to be facing, uh, they will have had a productivity skill, a productivity shock. They're going to be choosing how much to work and how much to save so as to maximize uh, their welfare, subject to a budget constraint. And what the budget constraint says simply that the usual consumption plus savings must be equal to Y, which is their labor income, A times 1 plus R, which is their, uh, uh, their capital earnings income. And from this, we're going to be subtracting taxes, which could depend on labor earnings, assets, and consumption. Let me just tell you quickly a bit more about what your labor earnings are. When you work, you're going to be choosing amount of time to work, so you're, it's going to depend on that. It's, you're going to have a unit return to your efficiency unit of labor, which is given by your education, which is the wage E, uh, W E. And then you're going to have a certain number of efficiency units. The number of efficiency units that you have is going to depend on your age, J, on your education, high school or college, on your agent, on the skills that you have, and on this productivity shock. Um, there are constraints to this problem. One's a borrowing constraint, which we don't write out in all its glory here. But the, the point is, yet you are going to, you cannot just borrow freely. You're going to be facing some constraint on assets, and you're endowed with a unit of time, which you can then decide how to spend. Um, how, again, just to uh, make it clear, how does uh, basic income change this? Well, it's going to change maybe the tax function that you face, uh, and it's going to augment the amount of resources that you have available to yourself. Um, quickly, to take you through the inter first intergenerational link, which is uh, investing in your child's skill. You're only going to be doing that for two periods. Uh, one period eight and nine. So think of it of, of the child being age zero through age seven. And now we're going to be adding to your state variable the child's level of skill. So uh, initially you can think of the child getting some draw, but then you're going to be deciding two more things, so, uh, more things uh, that you have to make decisions on. One is how much time you would like to spend on building your child's skill, and the other is how much money you would like to spend in building your child's skill. And now when you're solving this problem, you're going to be taking into account the evolution of the child's skills. Um, okay, um, let me 
take you just so that you have some idea of why we're talking about time and money to build child skills. This is the production function for child skills. It consists of two nested CESs. One is it's going to depend on their next period's child skills. It's going to depend on current period's child skills. A passive part on the part of the parents, which is how much skills the parents have. And then an active part on the part of the parents, which is parental investments. So this is the active intergenerational linkage. And in particular, these investments are going to themselves consist of a nested CES of money and time that they put into, um, that, they put it, that they invest into child skill production. Then these are also received a shock and the shock, uh, yeah, these also receive a shock. Okay. The last intergenerational linkage that I would like to uh, emphasize is the transfer to the child. This transfer to the child is made from the perspective of the parent at j equals 12. From the perspective of the child, it's happening right when the child is becoming an adult. So the parent is going to be solving the following uh, value function problem. They're going to be choosing how much to transfer to the child of their assets, a half. This a hat must cannot be negative, so they can give zero, but they can't leave the child with some debt. Uh, and they're going to be doing that to maximize their own continuation value and the expected value of their child's utility. Their child's utility is therefore going to depend on that a hat, their level of skills that they've now inherited, those are now fixed, and actually this epsilon, which is going to be a draw that the child is going to receive or that the parent is going to know after having made the transfer to the child. Uh, delta here, therefore, is a measure of altruism. It tells you how much uh, parents care about the child's continuation utility as of that point. Thereafter, the child is leaving the household and the parent is not going to be carrying any more state variables, as you can see here, of the child's uh, in their future uh, value functions. Okay. So I'm not going to talk to you about the child's college decision uh, because it'll take too much time. They're going to a child in period five, uh, having drawn their case for schooling, having their parents' uh, transfers, uh, having their skill level. They're going to decide uh, whether or not they want to go to college. They're going to be facing a budget constraint when they do that. Co college is costly. Not going to college is not costly. Uh, and they're going to decide uh, whether they want to go. Note again that you, uh, universal basic income matters because it's going to, again, augment the, uh, the income that's available to the child. Uh, okay. We have, uh, just to give you an idea of what we're, what's going on in the background, we're going to have fairly standard preferences. There's also going to be a disutility that's linear in time in terms of spending time with your child, investing in their skills. As I said, there's an uh, aggregate production function in the background that takes capital and human capital, where human capital are going to be the efficiency units of labor. Uh, again, aggregated in the following fashion, where H0 are the high school workers and H1 is going to be the efficiency units of the um, college workers. And of course, inside here, there's also the time that people are spending working of each type. Okay. Uh, we're going to solve for the stationary distribution of this economy, and then we're going to estimate this economy to the U.S. in the year 2000. When we do this, we use a uh, relatively large variety of micro data sets wherever possible, and I think it's basically always possible. We're going to be restricting uh, the data that we look at to two adult households to best match the model. So I want you to think about, yes, we keep on talking about the agent and the agent's child, but you want to think about this as being two people in the household, and then two kids in the household. Okay, I'm just going to uh, talk about the main features. Like in uh, Nicola's paper from yesterday, we're going to be using the Felstein and Bellum-Benabu uh, tax function in which after-tax labor income, uh, and this is now labor income, is going to depend on two parameters. So this is nonlinear. One is going to be lambda. And one is going to be, you could take it as a measure of the progressivity. That's how people uh, often interpret it, which is tau y. We're going to get tau y directly from Keith Coat, uh, Story Sled, and Angelante, who estimated this using US data. Uh, lambda, uh, I'll come back to in a second. 
To this, we're going to add a transfer. We're going to add omega. Why do we do this? Because as you can see in the Heath Code at all paper, if you don't do this, you're not going to fit as well the income of uh, low, labor, lo low labor income uh, agents. So we're going to add uh, uh, an omega to this. We're also going to allow for taxes on uh, capital income and taxes on consumption. These parameters we're going to be taking uh, directly from the data, but lambda and omega we're going to be estimating from our model. Uh, from, uh, mo from particular moments. There's one more uh, difference I would say that I would like to emphasize aside from uh, the intergenerational linkages and the tax function is that we add an out of work state to the standard AR1 wage process. So uh, kind of in the spirit of Castaneda and co-authors, we allow agents to have no labor income for a whole period. We call this the out of work shock. Note that this is a big shock. It means that you're out of work for four years. So we're going to estimate that directly from the data. Uh, okay. Uh, we just start using a probate model of working by education group using PSIT. Um, we use simulated methods of moments to match uh, the household level data. To fit the lambda and omega, we, you can, everything is uh, simultaneous, but you can think of it as being targeting um, the average proportion of your labor income that's paid in taxes and the ratio of the variance of pre to post tax income. And when we do that, we get an omega, just so that you know, of about $2,400. And uh, we also get a lambda uh, out of that. Um, okay, and then parental investment, and Diego has written extensively on this uh, come in child skills and in the transfers come from uh, PSID and CES. There's a whole bunch of external parameters. Uh, there's a whole bunch of internally estimated parameters. Here's, uh, I forgot to highlight this, but we will go on. Let me talk about the validation of the model. We look at a whole bunch of non-targeted moments. I think the most interesting one might be the labor income shares. We do a pretty good job on all of these. Uh, and we also look, uh, we also do validation within the model. That is, there's a range of estimates from the non-labor income elasticity of labor supply that uh, Blundell and McCurdy summarized. There's also um, uh, evidence on what an extra $1,000 to parents uh, with, who are relatively poor, who have annual income that's below $10,000, uh, what, what that does to their child's skills. And that comes from uh, Donna Lochner, who use exogenous changes to the earned income tax credit to try to estimate what, you know, what, what, what do we see uh, happening to those kids. So these are now really exogenous changes. Uh, and we apply these cash transfer experiments to our model. How do we do that? Well, these are small scale, so they're not GE. We don't let prices and taxes be affected. They're short run, so in terms of income, we give it to them for like either four years or five years, depending on the same year for the labor electricity, and they're targeted, at least for here, to parents who have income below a certain level. And then we show that our model is in line with these empirical results. Okay. All right, let me turn to the policy and to what we wanted to do. All right, so what we do in the model is, what, now that we have the, the, the model estimated, is that we give uh, enough money to all households, we consider UBI that's large, which gives $11,000 per year to each household. And this is thinking about the poverty level of about 5,500 for an adult. So this would be what a two-person household would get. We, there's many assumptions you can make in terms of what should be happening with uh, the government uh, budget constraint. We're gonna assume that the budget must remain balanced in the sense that you have to raise these additional funds uh, by changing the labor income tax. And in particular, we have us change Lambda. In our paper, we then look at various other things. I think the most interesting one is using a consumption tax, but uh, maybe Stephanie will have time to talk about it, but I unfortunately right now do not. Yeah, about okay. five minutes. Perfect. Okay. So, um, let me try to put this on. Um, okay. So, um, let me turn to the main thing that we want to do, which is to use, uh, to look at 
what the effect of universal basic income is on welfare. We want to think about where these changes are coming from. As I'm going to show you, we get important differences between the effects of UBI on generations who are alive when this policy is introduced versus uh, agents who are not alive or there during the transition. And furthermore, in the steady state, I'm going to distinguish between incentives, taxation, and general equilibrium effects. And then I want to really leave you with an idea of how important these endogenous intergenerational linkages are in the welfare results that we get. I won't have time to do that. So very quickly, uh, this is an uh, unexpected UBI policy, an MIT show. It happens at time equals zero. And what you can see uh, plotted here is the average of the marginal tax rate uh, on labor that agents face. I have all of these are deviations from um, the uh, initial steady state, and as you can see, it goes up by 50%, uh, something like 50%, and stays really high thereafter. Uh, what happens to the productivity of the new cohorts, and by productivity of the new cohorts, I mean how much efficiency, what's the, it would be like the wage return to their efficiency units as mediated by their education choice, and you can see there's an de important decrease uh, over 3% initially, and then continues to go down in terms of these. What's on the positive side? Well, after tax inequality is measured by the variance of the log of after tax income, decreases dramatically by 50, over 50% 50 in the new steady state. And intergenerational mobility, as measured by the um, absolute value of the coefficient on a rank rank uh, regression of child's income on parental income, uh, uh, also increases. So there's uh, things, the uh, society becomes more mobile. On the aggregate level, we have a large fall in GDP in the steady state, 13%. Uh, a very large fall in the uh, capital, over 20% of capital. And in particular, 20, uh, about 50% of the GDP uh, decrease is coming from the fall in capital. And the remainder is going to be uh, coming from the fall in aggregate efficiency units, both in terms of the education choices that people are making and in terms of how much work they're putting in. If you wanted to take a closer look at who wins and who gains uh, from this, this is uh, the right uh, picture to look at. Uh, over here on the left, I'm showing you what happens to cohorts uh, where zero is the cohort who is just born when this policy is introduced. And as you go to the left, all the way up to negative 20, you're just getting people, adults or, or kids, uh, but here, over here, there are adults, they're, they're just getting progressively older, okay? They're all separated by, in real life, by four years. And to the right are the new cohorts that are coming on board after this policy is introduced. So who gains and who loses? So what we find is that, you know, it, it's pretty dramatically different in the sense that older generations are going to gain on average. That is, if you were to integrate over everyone who was, an adult when this was introduced, so people of age J equal to five onwards, you would find an average gain, welfare gain and consumption equivalent units of about 1%. Who are these gains really occurring to? Mostly the oldest people, as you can see here, those who are non-college educated, that is they have a high school degree. Here I'm showing you by age and education, winners versus losers, uh, and also those agents who are out of work. Now, I want to say an important caveat here, which is that these gains, to some extent, become almost basically close to zero or even slightly negative, because these gains are to some extent driven by not considering the welfare of children once out of the house. So this is kind of a dirty secret if you do uh, overlapping generations and you have more than three periods, you've got to stop keeping track of your child state variables, otherwise it becomes an impossible problem to solve. So that's normally, okay, that's, that's not a problem. It's not going to change anything in welfare analysis. But when you have an unexpected introduction of a new policy, as the one here, that means parents whose children are out of the house don't care about their kids' welfare. And their kids' welfare has been made uh, much worse off uh, because of this policy. So when, what we did there is we did something, and I should, by we, I really mean Diego, did something uh, kind of computationally heroic, uh, which is to include the child's wealth, uh, the child's state variables, and redo analysis 
using that. And then we find like really that these gains become really, really small if, or even slightly negative. Uh, you know, for the really older age agents, we didn't do the analysis because some agents who are in the last two periods of life also have grandchildren. And then you would have a state space that would go up to 12. Uh, you would have 12 points in this argument. Okay. As you can see, there's very large steady state uh, welfare losses. They are uh, over nine, a little bit over 9%. So now I just want to very quickly, uh, Veronica, just tell you where, at least my co is gonna kill me if I don't do this, tell you where these steady state welfare gains and losses are coming from. So if you give me one last minute, I will zoom through it. One last minute. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, so um, in terms of, uh, you, you saw that in terms of consumption equivalence, this is not steady state welfare. You know, capital goes down by 20 points, the fraction of people go, of going to college goes down, as does labor productivity, parental transfers, uh, the money that people or our parents are spending on their kids and the amount of time they're spending on their kids. So kids' skills have gone way down, parental transfers have gone way down. Let's do the following thought experiments to understand where these are coming from. The first thought experiment says, suppose we gave this money, this UBI, to one generation only. Uh, they're adults at t equals, you know, we, we'll give it to them. They're at, at age equals uh, j equals five. What would they do with it? And they know that nobody else is getting it. Okay, well, they would put in, they want, and they don't have to pay for it, and there's no general equilibrium with that. So it's a really weird economy. Well, they would spend more time and more money on their kids. It would increase the transfers. Labor productivity would go up. College attendance would go up. And people, of course, love this world they'd be willing to sacrifice 19% of consumption in order to stay in this world. Let's do another exercise that's related, but instead of giving this manna from heaven to one generation, let's give it to all generations. Again, you don't have to pay for it. There's no general equilibrium effect. So now there's, incentive, you know, there's incentives that kick in. Okay, my kid's gonna be better off. They're gonna get UBI for the rest of their lives. So as all my grandchildren, et cetera, I'm not gonna spend time or money uh, or give them much transfers. Why, why should I? Uh, they're basically, and what's going to happen is their labor productivity is going to go down, real decrease in the fraction of people who goes to college, and a large decrease in the amount of capital in, the, in that new steady state. But this is a world that everybody loves. It's a great world. You know, you have insurance. You've got, you've got everything going for you. Now let's put in the tax that's needed to pay for this. And now you see really the negative consequences in terms of people would be willing to give up close to 12% of consumption to avoid this world. There's still no general equilibrium effect, but the capital stock goes way down. Why? People are really poor right now. So it's not the same uh, particular reason as over here. People are very poor. The fraction of people who goes to college falls further. So do parental transfers, definitely in the terms of the money that they get uh, and in terms of the time that they put in. So turning back again to the last line, the last line was our full steady state really economy. Need to wrap up now. Okay, our full steady state economy. And what you can see there is that the general equilibrium effects are mitigating the negative effect on transfers, college, and capital as it normally does in basically any model that I can think about, which sees these negative consequences because now capital has become more scarce. Uh, you know, college educated workers have become more scarce the uh, the uh, adjustment in prices gives rise to this. So I have to wrap up. I'm going to simply then hope that you ask me where do the, how important are the intergenerational linkages? And I will answer you at that point. Uh, but uh, let me just simply conclude. So we use the model to evaluate UBI. Um, what I had the chance to tell you was that it had very different welfare effects for those currently alive versus young and future generations. Um, the didn't have as much time as I would have liked to show you that endogenous and generational links play a quantitatively very important role in these results. In particular, what they do is they change the distribution over the state space, and that contributes over to a 48% fall in steady state welfare. Thank you for asking me to discuss this paper. It's very, very interesting and obviously on a very topical issue, uh, universal basic income. So this is um, a very, very interesting paper that actually tries to see what's happening in a dynamic intergenerational setting. And so what's interesting is that most papers study the effect of current taxes and transfers that we have on labor supply, for instance, and then extrapolate from there to what we can expect the effects of UBI to be. 
Um, obviously, since we don't have a UBI in many places, that's the best we can do um, in, in a reduced form sense, but these are always short run effects. And so it's very important to know for such a big, you know, possibly system changing policy, what the long-term intergenerational consequences will be. And since there's no possibility to do an experiment and to wait for two or three generations for that, um, the authors have the great idea to use a proper intergenerational dynamic model to see what will happen over the long run. And so the main, the main findings, which Raquel had to rush through, um, so I can re-summarize them for you, uh, is that in the short run, which means, I guess, the current cohort mostly, uh, UBI is very good for low incomes, as you may expect, um, despite you know, the disincentive effects of the higher taxes to, to fund it. But over the longer run, um, this, this increased taxes to fund it are going to generate a lot of output losses. Uh, it's going to lead to reduced labor supply, savings, human capital acquisition. And so in the long run, it's going to be a very costly policy in terms of GDP. And something she did not have time to really cover much, but if you think of part of the reason for UBI is being to possibly sustain incomes when there's a lot of automation or robotization, then if there's a risky economy in the sense that some jobs will be at bigger risk of being um, automated and your income will fall to zero or your skills will be rendered obsolete, uh, then there's actually a stronger polarization on the preferences. So some people you know, in the current cohort really want it, but it's costly for the future cohort. And another thing that the authors do is to say, can we possibly you know, complement this with another policy? And the answer is yes. So clearly UBI is very useful to smooth the transition for those whose skills will be made obsolete, for instance, through robotization, but actually combining it with policies that then foster the human capital of the future generation. So for instance, early childhood development policies is good because it ensures that the future cohorts will also acquire skills and remain productive. So that's what I viewed as the main findings. And um, my, I basically have three big comments here. Um, so first of all, it's, I think to me, this is like an excellent use of, you know, what structural models should be used for, which is there are things we just can't see otherwise. And uh, I think this is a very, very nice use case here. Um, obviously these are policy decisions that have to be made today and there's no other evidence. So we have to somehow extrapolate from the short run through a model to the long run. Um, the data is very good for this, um, you know, matching the right moments, state of the art structural techniques. So nothing to be said on that. It's really, really excellent. So what I thought was particularly great um, is that the model is actually very complete. You probably got the sense of that from the timeline but it has all the life stages you need to actually be able to think of this question in detail. So uh, both the childhood part, uh, the work life, the retirement, um, and the intergenerational links. So it's a really, really complete life cycle model. And then Raquel didn't have time to go through all of this, but there's actually a lot of validation exercises in the paper um, to show that you know the current model, since we're gonna extrapolate from it so much, that that model actually very well fits current, you know, the current data and the current moments. So that's all excellent. So I want to take a tiny step back for those of you who are not steeped in progressive taxes and UBI to tell you just conceptually how to think about this. So I, I actually teach this um, because I think students are very interested and it's slightly confusing until you've seen it once, then you can no longer unsee it. So this is the ManQ quiz, um, I guess, because it was on Greg ManQ's blog. Uh, but how should you think about universal basic income versus what we already have? So in an econ consider an economy in which average income is 50,000, but that has a lot of income inequality. And so we want to provide some social safety net. And you get the choice between two systems here. Either you get a universal transfer of 10,000 to every person, that's a new BI, and you're going to finance it by a 20% flat tax on income. So note that this is a pretty high tax relative to what we have. Okay, on average. Now, the second system is you're just gonna give what we sort of currently do, so a means-tested transfer of 10,000. That amount goes to someone who has zero income, but then it's gonna get phased out. So as you start earning more, you're gonna lose 20 cents of every dollar you earn. And how are we gonna finance this? Well, we're gonna impose a tax on the higher income, so everybody who's above average income, which is 50,000 here, will pay a 20% tax rate. So that's basically a transfer, means-tested with a progressive tax rate. So that's mimicking what we have. So you can think for a second which system you would prefer. 
Um, and, you know, you can think about it for a bit, but obviously it's a trick question. Uh, these two systems are equivalent. They're, they give exactly the same budget constraint. So, of course, you can tweak the numbers. But the point is, having this lump sum transfer at the bottom, this R, in our tax models, we actually call it the demo grant or the intercept of the tax function. You can call it UBI. Then it has to be financed by something which is a flat phase out rate, for instance, so it gives you a slope one minus tau, or you can think of it as a transfer that gets phased out and then has a tax rate above a given level of income. And if those numbers match up, it can be equivalent to a flat tax. And you can make it as complicated as you want, but the point is a basic income and a means test to transfer it's just a difference in degree, not a difference in kind. So these are already things we have. And I think that's important also for this paper uh, because when people talk about basic income, it sounds like something that's completely different from what we have. And in fact, it's not. It just means giving more generous transfers at the bottom. Um, and then the question becomes, what's better in terms of the, you know, the pitch of it? And here's what you know, typically people have said to say pro-basic income is perhaps better politically because it's less stigmatizing than a means test to transfer. On the other hand, having a very generous basic income requires also possibly you know, higher nominal taxes, which of course will then get rebated back since it's equivalent to what we have. So it's mainly a sort of you know, formulation uh, for policy purposes. Now, how does it affect the current paper? Well, I think that that actually means for the current paper, that it's, it's way more general. It's really about how progressive of a system should we have in a sense. And so I think the pitch is beyond UBI. It's basically to what extent do generous transfers, means tested transfers, transfers towards low incomes, you know, to what extent do they benefit people in the short run versus the long run? So in a sense, I think the paper is really about that whole progressivity of the tax system, especially as geared towards the bottom. And so in my view, the question is really what will minimize the efficiency cost for the highest, I've put here, XX gain, where XX is what you care about, could be welfare, could be income, could be GDP growth, skills, and then for whom. And so it's really an optimal sort of progressivity problem in my, in my view. So the paper has a great framework that's way more complete than, than other papers, uh, in particular with all these life stages and intergenerational link to be able to address this question generally. And so I think there's two open questions which you may wanna think about. Uh, so you combine this very nicely with uh, early childhood development policies. I was thinking, what about what we have, which is an EITC, Earned Income Tax Credit, which is basically something that gives an in-work in subsidy for those who start working who have low earnings. It gives you a little bump up relative to your wage. And so if you think about that as well, then what shape should the phase out rate take? because there's a lot of basically mitigation you can do possibly with an EITC on top uh, that will, that will you know, prevent the labor supply responses. And the reason I'm saying that is because we know from empirical work that really the labor supply responses are not at the top. It's not the people who will pay a bit more tax at the top that are gonna generate the big cost. It's really the intensive margin at the bottom and the disincentives to work at the bottom, which you can possibly mitigate with a milder phase out. So that's something I think to consider uh, possibly. The second, the second question, um, I don't have an answer to it, but depending on the size of the UBI or the means tested transfer, it could be a sort of system changing policy. And so maybe the supply side will also adapt to it. Um, so in a sense, the robotization, automation, these are not exogenous factors here. Um, if everybody gets a more generous transfer and some jobs are just not attractive anymore, you can imagine the whole uh, supply side distribution to change as well. And that's also part of the debate. So two big open questions, which perhaps you'll be able to address here or in a follow-up paper. But I think it's a very, very interesting framework to be able to answer the more general question about a progressive means tested transfer and perhaps address these additional design issues here. Okay, uh, absolutely fascinating paper and discussion. And I just wanted to uh, add that there's uh, actually some recent evidence by Gordon Dahl in a forthcoming paper with a co-author on the intergenerational effects of the uh, change in disability in the Netherlands. And it's really cool because what happened was when they became much tighter and less generous, the sons, particularly of fathers who got their disability cut, were more likely to go to school and less likely to be on disability later. So there's a little bit of micro evidence that's appearing now. 
Thank you. Hi, super impressive setup and uh, not to add any more bells and whistles to the environment to think about, but you know, we're talking about it, Raquel. I couldn't help but thinking, you know, what about kids who care about their parents, um, especially as parents age? Um, seems like, you know, they there is some utility going the other direction and siblings care about each other as well. Um, uh, just a quick clarification. Uh, when you think about the stage in which a household is uh, producing and consuming public goods that are kids, uh, how do you think about the utility, the consumption entering utilities, the unitary household models, or do you allow for private public interaction in production and consumption? Okay, uh, thanks a lot to, to the discussants and thanks for your questions. Uh, you know, uh, Stephanie, I think there's always a little bit of a tension between, you know, the literature that's more um, positive oriented, or at least it's still trying to look at a reform, and then optimal, uh, you know, optimal taxation, like the kind that Alan was doing, or the kind that you're talking about. I do agree, though, uh, precisely with what happened with, uh, when Alan was talking, that it'd be nicer for them to meet. So I'm not sure we can do an optimal progressivity, but it'd be nice to think about what... Uh, what alternative ways of funding this would uh, give rise to greater gains or smaller losses and for whom. Um, that said, you know, when one starts to do that, uh, one gets into the type of question that you're talking about, which is, gee, the current system that we have just sucks. I mean, like in our model, it makes much more sense to increase uh, the consumption tax. Okay, that's going to tend to have large gains associated with that for reasons that are very related to family judge type of results, which is that here you have old people, they have their savings, you can basically tax it away by taxing consumption in an undistortionary fashion, okay, because they're, they're retired. And so I'm not, I'm not sure how much I, I think we would have to contribute to, you know, really just getting uh, very deeply into it. But uh, that said, I, I certainly take your general point that we should be thinking much more generally. This is equivalent to, uh, you know, uh, other, other forms of taxation. Let's talk about it that way in the beginning. So that, that's, that's a great remark. Um, Elena, we, our children are born exogenously uh, and a given number. And so for that, for better or for worse, we don't deal, therefore have to deal with the question of, you know, how much, you know, how do you get utility from their kids? Is there some joint production going on in the household? Those are all, you know, fascinating questions, uh, which hopefully one day we would get at. I, I think it'd be very Sorry, interesting. Sorry, I missed that. But these are all fascinating questions, which I think we should, you know, be tackling at some point in some future of some paper, along with additional degrees of heterogeneity. Um, I thought, uh, Sydney, uh, your question, thank you, about, you know, it really bothers me that the parents, the parents don't care about the children when they're out of the household. And I do think it is a kind of a dirty trick that people play in these models. And then when Diego and I discuss this and I'm like, okay, we can't do that. We have to report this and we put it in a footnote. Uh, his answer was, well, but, you know, but it's true that, that also kids care about parents. And I completely agree with you. I mean, we all know that kids care about parents. Uh, those of us who are good kids, uh, we care about our parents and uh, let alone siblings that I'm, I'm more doubts about, but definitely parents. And, you know, you start getting all sorts of games that are played when uh, parents care about kids and kids care about parents. Now, that's not a very good reason not to do it, but I don't think this paper is going to be the one. And I strongly encourage you to 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 dip your hands into this one.